So uh, I used to like to take a selfie with uh, awesome audience before starting. So would you mind to take a selfie with me? <laughs> OK. Let's try to get as many people as possible, maybe this side. Yes, no. All right, yeah, this works. All right, cheers. OK, that's going on Twitter right now under DevOpsPL, hashtag. All right, so offline first apps with web components. Approximately 10 years ago, we saw an emerge in the, or a hype in the so-called cloud. People were advocating about cloud, that we, we need to move our desktop applications to the cloud. Everyone who was developing an executable application or an EXE or a desktop application was told that cloud is going to take over and it's a good time to migrate to a browser-based application. Even though it was a hype, but it proved that it is effective. And nowadays, it's no longer a question to ask if we should develop for cloud or not. Whenever we start a new application, by default, we make it on the cloud available on all browsers, on dev all devices, tablets, mobiles, and everything. But that's from the old, old time. Nowadays, we are talking about mobile taking over. So nowadays, a lot of people are telling that you should develop for mobile devices, you should uh, consider mobile first design, and so on. And if you are really following what big companies like Microsoft and Google are doing right now, you're going to figure out that it's not really mobile is taking over. They are robots who are taking over, isn't it? So uh, in the near future, we're going to see robots doing most of our jobs, communicating with us. We have seen a huge uh, uh, emerge in the AI system developed by many companies, especially Microsoft and Google. But at the end of the day, Unless robots take over, we still need to configure those robots and we need some kind of interface to be able to communicate with them, configure them, program them, and so on. So hello everyone, my name is Mati. I work as a developer advocate. And I'm not from Texas. I live in Finland, which is a really beautiful Nordic country. I welcome you all to visit. And I work for Vaden. So how many of you heard about Vaden before? Interesting. So for the two of you who didn't raise their hand, uh, Vaden is a UI framework for building a web application in Java. But nowadays, Vaden is uh, taking a completely different curve. So Vaden, for those who have heard about Vaden before, used to be uh, a framework. But now we are uh, expanding our platform completely to uh, incorporate new web standards and new web technologies outside the Java ecosystem, outside the browser ecosystem. I'm not going to talk today much about Vaden, but I'm going to today focus on my intro, which is why cloud was a hype and what's going to happen now. What about mobile? So uh, to start, I will tell you a small story that happened with me two months ago. I visited this little interesting country called America. And when I arrived at, at the airport, it was in Austin, it was very lovely. But uh, as an EU citizen, I didn't have any uh, US cash with me. And I wanted to go to my hotel, but without going to currency exchange or without having to hold any money in my hand. And I thought that we are in a very advanced era now, and I should be able to do everything with my mobile device. There definitely should be a way to go to my hotel room using public transportation without having to exchange money and get cash and those kind of things. I googled and I found that, yes, that's true. There is a nice app called Cap Metro, not advertising about it or anything, it's a government app or something. <laughs> and that started at 5.23 p.m., note the time. I decided that, okay, no problem. Um, the next bus is uh, leaving 
in seven minutes, and in seven minutes, I should definitely be able to buy a bus ticket. I mean, think about seven minutes. Seven minutes is not a small number. Seven minutes, you can do plenty of things. You can do fold laundry, uh, scan a magazine. You, do a, you can do a lot of things in seven minutes. So definitely, I should be able to buy a bus ticket in seven minutes. The thing is, uh, the thing is, um, buses are coming every half an hour. And the next bus is coming at 5.30. So that makes sense. I started by downloading my app. I noticed that the app is 18 megabyte. I was on an airport Wi-Fi, so it was a bit slow. But still, I said, OK, 18 megabyte to buy a bus ticket doesn't make much sense. But still, I will just try to go with it. I waited till the app got downloaded. That's a true story, by the way. And then after that, when I opened the app, after asking me for permissions, and that is going to read my secret pictures and everything, uh, it asked me to sign up. Based on my experience, signing up on a mobile device is not really easy. Writing my first name, last name, address, email, confirm, password, password first time, and so on. Luckily, the app developers provided me with an alternative way of signing up, which is Facebook or Google+. So I decided to sign up with Facebook. That's going to be a little bit easier, isn't it? No. Because I didn't have Facebook app installed. I'm, I'm this kind of guy that don't have Facebook app installed on his device. And that means that I need to fill my Facebook data manually. And to my surprise, I didn't remember my password for Facebook, because usually it's automatically filled on my browser. But here I have a native app, so I don't know the password. After struggling with this a little bit and finally figuring out the password, it asked me for two-way authentication to confirm my password. I had to wait for SMS and come. Yeah, it, it happened. And after that, I finally managed to sign up. Everything went great. Everything was perfect till I came at the point of purchase because it asked me again for my credit card information. I started to type my 16-digit credit card information, my expiration date, my shipping address, all those kind of things. It didn't take a, a lot of time because after seven minutes, I looked at the clock and I found that it's 6.01 p.m. Yes, which means that I didn't only miss the first bus, I missed also the second bus. The second bus was at 6 p.m. and I missed two buses. And that means that to be able to move from the airport with the next bus, I need to take the bus at 6.30. I didn't only waste almost 38 minutes, I wasted one hour and seven minutes just waiting for the bus. I'm not saying that the bus system in Austin is bad or anything. Actually, that's uh, an advanced system uh, that they have over there. They have an app for managing the bus system. They have um, very advanced uh, bus uh, connections and so on. Um, I'm just saying that this app is not for me, not for a casual visitor to the city. This app is designed for local people living there that are going to sign up once and then live with it for their, their entire life for years. But for a casual visitor that just need to come there, take a bus ticket, and then leave after a few days, it's not the right choice. The story, the story didn't finish yet. So later on, I went to the hotel, and uh, upon checkout, check-in, I mean, uh, they told me, hey, if you download our app, you will be able to open your hotel room with your mobile device. You don't need to have a key anymore. And you will be able to collect perks and rewards. You will be, you will be able to also get your receipt and check in information and some notification, all those kind of things. I told them, I'm actually in need of some sleep. And Choosing between all those perks that you just told me and just sleeping before one hour more, one, uh, of one, one more hour of wasted time, I would go for sleeping. 
So I'm not really a tech guy. I'm not a technology guy anymore. And I would love to have these old school keys that just open the door whenever I want. <laughs> I don't want to install any apps anymore. Yeah, that was exactly my experience when I reached the hotel. So I transformed myself. I'm no longer a technology guy. And actually, this applies in many other apps that we are seeing uh, around us. So for example, I'm here. I'm not from Krakow. And when I visited, if I want to, for example, order pizza, and then uh, the website tells me, to order pizza, you need to download our app to be able to order. And then I will go over these steps again, sign up, credit card information, and so on. That's not really practical. Same applies to many, many applications. I'm not saying that native apps are going anywhere, but native apps sometimes don't make sense. Sometimes you need to progressively understand your user before moving the user to a native app. This is an old screenshot taken from LinkedIn website when you open the website from browser, and it tells you download the app. Whenever you open LinkedIn.com, it tells you download the app. And from user experience perspective, this is fail because it's taking one quarter of my screen size just to tell me about something that most probably I don't want to do. I'm also not these kind of guys that have a native LinkedIn app on my mobile device because of basic reasons. I don't use LinkedIn that much. Probably I check LinkedIn once or twice per month. You think about it. How many times do you use LinkedIn? Do you really need a native app installed on your device keeping asking you for updates, keeping uh, a memory and uh, size, maybe sending you unneeded notifications, all those kind of things. Some of you will agree with me that we don't need a native LinkedIn app. I just need to casually visit LinkedIn on a browser whenever needed. And this applies to many, much more apps. There are many, uh, many, many statistics statistics related to this. So some statistics are related to, for example, uh, how many apps are we using on daily basis. So uh, it says that out of your 200 or 300 native apps that you have on your mobile device, 80% of your time you are using only three apps. Think about it. You will find only three apps that you are, uh, th they are dominating your usage of the mobile only. And also think about it. Let, let me ask you this direct question. If you think about one last month ago, how many apps did you install? OK, so raise your hand if it's five. OK, a lot of them. Raise your hand if it's three. OK, raise your hand if it's one. Yeah, most probably one. Raise your hand if you didn't install any app last month. OK, OK, like mostly 40%. That's, that's the point. Statistics shows that unless it's a new mobile phone that you just bought and you are installing all the apps in the world, then your install rate per month is zero. You don't need new native apps. You have three apps occupying 80% of your usage of the mobile, and you don't really need native apps. Again, I'm not saying that native apps are going anywhere. I'm saying that sometimes they don't need make sense. And the alternative thing is called Progressive Web Apps. So Progressive Web Apps is the new hype. How many of you heard about Progressive Web Apps? Okay, good. So um, Progressive Web Apps is the new hype. It's, um, it's not made up by a small company or something. It's uh, accumulation of research done by big players in the market and big vendors, including Microsoft, Google, um, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Apple is not yet. Apple is still didn't decide yet what they want to do about it. But uh, in brief, I would say this is the new move from native apps to the cloud, but for mobile devices. It, uh, progressive web apps mean building mobile web applications that are fast, engaging, they use service worker notifications. They use native capabilities of the device. But uh, today, I selected out of the many topics that are available for Productive Web App, the offline first design. Because it's the only way to guarantee 100% always on user experience. When you open a web application, such as Twitter, for example, and you start to use it, 
and then you lose signal, you don't want to lose your user. You, don't, you want your application to keep working and keep interacting with your user, right? And then if uh, you get back to communication, like if you get the signal again, then you want to make sure that you can, your user can continue using what he started. So if he wrote a tweet, for example, if he saved modifications, if he did something, then you want those modifications to keep going on. So um, yeah, as I was saying, progressive web apps is, is not a new framework. It's not a new programming language or anything. If you are a web developer, then most probably you are using some of web, uh, progressive web apps capabilities already. But um, it's, it's, um, it's like a big topic that consists of many things. But what I'm going to focus on today, the, or, or my motivation for today, is the offline first design. Now, if we take one step back and think about technology in general, so all the time I've been mentioning mobile devices, mobile devices, it seems that people are using mobile devices more and more, and we have many statistics showing that people who are using mobile devices exceeded those who are using laptops. Number of websites visited by mobile devices is way more now than laptops. And this makes me wonder, because as a developer or a content producer, in my office, eight hours per day, I need to use a laptop. I cannot develop on a mobile device. So how come the number of users moving to mobile device increased? That doesn't make much sense for me. I need screen, big screen. I'm using heavy applications. I need heavy processor for them, like you are using an IDE or maybe photo editing tool or movie editing and so on. And moreover, you have high speed broadband in your office. So what's going on? Why people are using more mobile devices? Actually, the answer to this is we are content producers. And content producer here, I don't mean a person who is uh, writing a blog post or writing a content, but I mean a person who is producing web applications, mobile applications, or any kind of content, even if it's a video, even if it's uh, slides, and so on. So a content producer is a person who needs this kind of device for his daily productivity, but we, the content producers, are very small, tiny bit of the whole population of people out there that are using internet. And if you want to target another content producer like us, we are, we are a framework people, we, we are targeting developers, so our audience is very, very small. But if you want to target more users, the open world or billions, as Google says, then you need to think differently. Because users generally don't really care about technology. They are not like us. They are different species, right? <laughs> they don't care about having the latest processor. They don't care about having the latest updates. They don't care to have broadband internet connected all the time. They want something that just work. Something intuitive, something that appealing, that, well, that is well designed and just work. So, um, to put everything all together, I am going to show you today a demo on how to um, develop an offline first application. But um, to do that, since all the time I'm talking about uh, latest web standards and latest technology, I decided to do this demo using web components. So first of all, who heard about web components before? Interesting. So um, web components is the new standard. It's not a hype anymore. Maybe one year ago, it was a hype. But nowadays, it started to be a standard. And it consists of four major topics. So it consists of templates, shadow DOM, HTML imports, and custom elements. Just in brief, for those who didn't hear about web components before, it's a way of redefining the way we are constructing our HTML in such a way that we can include some of the object-oriented capabilities inside your browser, like interoperability, 
like inheritance, like uh, other things in OPP. So how it works, basically you define your own custom tag. So in HTML we used to have this tag called div, input, span, and so on. Those are the standard tags. But with, HT with web components you can define your own tag and start to use it. And this tag is going to produce you some kind of template. I'm not gonna go over web components in much details, except that I'd love to show you one example, like Vaden Date Picker. So this is one of uh, web components that we have developed. It's available freely open source. And when you put this HTML tag inside your HTML page, what you will get is this thing on the left side. Precisely, what you will get is this blue bar on the top and this icon. And when you click on this icon, the date field will drop and you can start to select date. So having a fully fledged date component is now possible with one line of HTML. And this is because of web components. As I said, it's now standard. It's now uh, available in all browsers. More or less, Safari is now coping up with this, but we believe that uh, the next version of Safari at least the beta version now supports a lot of things of web components, so we are seeing this even uh, uh, possible on iPhone devices. And talking about those web components, we have also developed uh, many of other web components. They are all freely available open source. And this is what I was trying to explain, so we are now moving from Java ecosystem to uh, web ecosystem and make it, making it uh, reachable for more developers. So not only Java developers, but even if you are developing with Angular, Polymer, React, any framework, JS, or even .NET or any other programming language, you can basically use this. And this is not because of a magic that we are doing, this is because of the magic of web components. So web components is now an open standard that allows you to use this web component just like any HTML tag that you used to use. So that makes me wonder how many of you are using Angular, by the way? Yes, Angular 3? None? Angular 3? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, how many of you are Java developers as well? Okay, yeah. So that's clearly uh, the majority here are Java developers. Luckily, um, I'm going to show you probably is the Java part, but let's see how, how well the, go, the demo will go today. But yeah, so to put everything together, I talked about web components, I talked about offline first, and now we need to use, oh, I, f I forgot to mention one more thing. Why web components? Why web components in an offline first design topic? And uh, the main reason is uh, because of web components are going to help me achieve this a little bit easier. So they are uh, supporting the advanced caching mechanism, they are supporting uh, the advanced web technologies that we can use in offline first design. And this is what I'm going to show you in the demo. So offline first web components, what is the solution that we can do to, get, to make our application work offline? The first solution that can uh, come to most of you is caching. Caching as in browser caching. Uh, so can we just cache the website and that's it? Whenever you open a web page, just cache it in the browser cache and problem solved, isn't it? Actually, even in web components, in Polymer elements, there is a platinum element now called, um, well, the platinum elements in general, they allow you to cache the web page and cache the web components easily without doing much of work. And many of web components based on Polymer library are already cacheable by default without doing any extra code. So problem solved. Anyone see a problem with caching? No problem? Sorry? Invalidation. Yes, what will happen if the cache disappear? The browser controls the cache. Any more problem with caching? Sorry? Being? Up to date. Uh, I, think, I think you can get over this. You can forcefully update the cache, define the new cache path and so on. 
So there is a workaround for this. Actually, there is another problem with caching, which is probably caching is suitable for static web pages. If you have a static website, just five pages, you cache them in the browser, problem solved. But what if your web page is dynamic? I believe most of you are developing dynamic web pages. And for example, I open a form, and when I click on a list item, then the form gets populated with some values. So how can I do that with just caching? This is an offline mechanism, an offline code that needs to be executed, some offline interactivity that needs to be done. So caching is not suitable for enterprise level and most of dynamic web application. That's why they came up with the so-called offline storage. Offline storage is, or maybe you can call it indexed DB. Yes, indexed DB is still a thing, and it's, it makes a lot of sense now because now there is a lot of APIs that support it and a lot of platforms that support it. So having an indexed DB, isn't it like a good solution? Instead of just caching your website, forcefully save your data in a form of a database or something like that inside your browser, and the browser will do the rest of the work. We'll keep the data, we'll persist the data, and then you can retrieve it later. Even though this is an ideal solution and it has been used for many years now, it has a big drawback. Anyone know what is the drawback of offline storage? Yes, synchronization. Why? Sorry? Uh, I can't hear that. It's difficult. Well, kind of difficult. Actually, the biggest problem is data replication, as you said, synchronization. So what if I modified the data? How can I push it back to the server? It's very easy to take a copy of the data available on the server and download it inside the browser and then make it available offline. That's very easy. But that's so-called read-only mode. What if I modified the data? How can I push it back to the server? That's going to be tricky. And as he said, it's difficult as well. So data replication is the next topic, and that has been uh, discussed, and that has been like the research topic for many, many uh, vendors. Uh, and there are a lot of solutions, and one of the famous solutions is Firebase. So Firebase uh, used to be an independent company uh, that was solely focusing on this topic, data replication, but now it has been acquired by Google, and now when I say Firebase, probably it means many, much more things like the Firebase platform and uh, the cloud platform and so on. But let's just focus on the Firebase data replication topic or libraries that are responsible of basically solving this problem. So what Firebase offers, it tells you if you buy a server from us and buy subscription or like a perpetual license and uh, implement on the back end Firebase database, then on the front end, you're going to get this offline storage and data replication out of the box. This sounds like a very nice solution and it has been implemented by many enterprises but it also still have some drawbacks. So the biggest drawback is the restriction. You have to implement a Firebase backend. What if you are using an Oracle database? What if you have to use an Oracle database, or MySQL, or MariaDB, or Postgres, or something like that? And the second drawback is the limitation of the server. So you have to use a Google server. What if you, for some reason, don't trust Google server? Some people don't. So Firebase sometimes doesn't uh, satisfy people. Of course, also because of the cost. So some startups don't like the cost of Firebase, but I will not discuss the cost at this point. I'm just going to discuss a little bit more interesting topic, which is the freedom of Firebase. Is it open source? It's not. Luckily, there are many other alternative open source libraries, and one of them, the most uh, the one that I most love, which is PowerDB. It's an open source Apache 2.0 available solution for doing exactly the same thing and even more. So 
again, what is the biggest problem about pushing the data back from, from browser to the server? If you have one specific database, let's, let's call it for, uh, Firebase, for example, then you know the protocol of how to insert the data inside the database. You, know, you have a unified platform and data replication is easy. But in the case of PouchDB, it's a little bit tricky because uh, dealing with Oracle is different than dealing with MySQL, is different than dealing with Postgres, is different than dealing with MariaDB and so on. You have a big wide range of databases and dealing with all of them generally, depending on your application, is quite challenging. That's why they came up with a middle solution called CouchDB. So CouchDB, of course, existed before PouchDB, and CouchDB is just a document DB layer that you can implement on top of your database. And then they said that we are going to deal with CouchDB. CouchDB is free, open source as well. So you all to have to do is implement CouchDB layer on top of your database, and then PouchDB will do the rest of the magic for you. This chart shows how it works. So basically, we see that our mobile device does not deal with the server at all. There is no single connection between the server and the mobile device. You're going to implement the PouchDB library in the middle between the mobile device and CouchDB. And then CouchDB is your layer in front of the server. So now you can make bidirectionally data replication between the mobile device and PouchDB. What will happen if the connection is lost? The connection is lost means that PouchDB is no longer connected with CouchDB. What will happen will be like that. Your still mobile device is dealing with PouchDB, not CouchDB. So things will still work. Your application will still be working fully, even though you are offline. And then when you go back online, then we can go back to this state again, and any modifications that you have done offline will be pushed back to the server. So this is the whole thing about PouchDB. Um, and in my demo, I'm going to use PouchDB because we're going to see that it has some magic. And uh, this magic is going to make a lot or take away a lot of hassle of managing offline storage manually and synchronization manually as well. Sounds good? Let's start. So um, in my demo, I need to switch screen, I think. Those are the Vaden elements, by the way, if you want to check them. There are many more Vaden elements now available. But yeah, let's. So in my demo today, uh, instead of coding live, because it's going to be boring, I know, I'm going to show you the steps that I've done on a git diff basis and, see you, uh, and show you what the differences that I have implemented between every step. So instead of coding, I'm going to just show you the code difference between each step. Uh, and of course, the application is available open source over here. I should increase the font a bit. Yeah. So this is application. It's my handle underscore uh, backslash offline dash first dash app if you want to check it out. Uh, and if you want to monitor uh, future updates of this app and see what I'm going to do next with it, probably you would like to also uh, watch this uh, application. This is how the final application should look like. And those are the steps. So as I said, they are divided into 10 clear steps. You can go over them and check them out. And I have them here opened already. Uh, and this is also something that I want to show you. This is a CouchDB. So I have a local installation of CouchDB. I'm, I'm like making a demo of having a local CouchDB installed, local server installed, and CouchDB protocol on top of it. So this is my CouchDB that is running locally. So step number one. Since I decided to use web components, I decided to also use Polymer CLI, command line interface. And this po Polymer CLI is allowing me to initiate a web component-based application quite quickly. 
It's very nice and interesting. So nothing here interesting in this code except that I used the Polymer CLI and said in it. And with in it, I started an empty application. That's it. Nothing interesting at this point. It created all the needed uh, files and structure folders for my application. And this is how it looked like. Hello, offline first app. That's the beginning. Nothing fancy at this point. Now, the second step is um, I decided in this demo to show you um, how to migrate an existing application from being non-offline to be offline first. So if you are starting over from the beginning, then that's the ideal time to start thinking offline first design from the beginning. But if you already have an application, which is most of the cases, then this demo is going to a little bit help you on sh showing you what are the steps and what you need to do to migrate from uh, an application that is relying on the server all the time to an application that works with PowerDB. So to do that, I started by a demo application that has a grid that load data easily. Uh, at this point, I used a Vaden grid because it's easy for me to develop. Nothing fancy except that I, I added this Vaden grid. So you can see that I used web components again, Vaden dash grid. I gave it an ID called lazy grid. And then here, I defined the columns for the grid. I defined that the first column should be automatically rendered by the index. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then uh, I have a get JSON function here. This is the function responsible about communicating with the server to get the data. So at this point, I'm not implementing any offline first or anything. Get JSON uh, makes an AJAX request to request the data and push it in, inside the grid. And then this is the grid items. This is the lazy loading part. That is, whenever I scroll, it's going to lazily load more items from the server. So kind of infinite loading of data. And just some styles and CSS and so on, so nothing except this. And this is how it looked like. So this is a grid. Whenever I scroll, um, and to prove that this grid is actually working depending on the, uh, on the internet, I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi, and if I reload this page, you're going to see the problem. So now it's stuck in an infinite loading state. Why? Because I lost connectivity, and it doesn't work anymore. And this is the problem that I want to solve now. So I want to make this application still work, even if I don't have Wi-Fi. Just to keep track of what I did, I will close those. <laughs> OK, so this doesn't work. So the next step that I decided to do is to implement CouchDB protocol. And instead of getting the data from the server, I want to get it from my Pouch DB. So to do that, I defined an object of type Pouch DB. And this object, can you see the font, or do I need to increase the font a bit? Is it good on the back side? OK. Uh, so the Pouch DB. Here, when I defined the PouchDB object, I added a protocol. And when you add a protocol, PouchDB will automatically understand that this is an existing server, and it's going to try to connect to our PouchDB server. So I didn't specify any extra parameters or anything. Everything will happen automatically. And I called this variable the remote DB. So this is a pointer to my remote database. And then, instead of loading the data this way, grid.items, instead of get JSON, I got rid of get JSON function, and I replaced it with an instance of remote database. So now my data is coming from remote DB. So what happens? Now my server is connected with CouchDB, and my CouchDB is connected with PouchDB. And now I'm going to connect with PouchDB, exactly the graph that I sh just showed to you in my slides. Now I'm going to fetch the data all the time from PouchDB. Now let's see the results. So if I reload, this page still works. So that was easy. I implemented offline first in just one step. Instead of loading the data 
from the server replace all instances from referring to the server to an instance of a remote DB. But that's not everything, isn't it? So now I, I just did the first step, which is relying on an offline storage, and that's a read-only mode. Probably we need to do more. I want to make sure that I will load the data from local storage even if I lose connectivity at all. So the previous step, I had CouchDB up and running here, and that's why the data was loading. But what if I lost the connectivity to CouchDB? So CouchDB is my server right now, so, right? So what I, if I lost connectivity to CouchDB? For doing this step, let's go a little, oh, I don't have internet so I cannot go up, but what I did here is I defined another variable called local DB. And here, local DB is an object of PouchDB that points to a variable name that doesn't have any protocol called local underscore PouchDB. It can be anything. And here, another magic of PouchDB, it will automatically understand that I need to create a local storage of my database. So up there, I cannot show it here because it's cut, but up there, that was the previous variable. It's called remote DB that was pointing to a protocol, localhost, port, and so on. And this one is a bit different. It's local DB variable. And here, I decided to tell PouchDB replicate, make a replication between remote database and local database. Local database exists inside my browser. Remote database is a CouchDB database. And replaced all remote DB instances with local DB instances. So now I'm making sure that the application is all the time pointing to the database inside my browser, not the CouchDB database at all. And this is exactly what I'm going to show here. So even though if I remote, reload now, you will not see much differences, but the big difference is if I turn off CouchDB, then this application so, should still work. So I'm gonna kill CouchDB, just to make sure. Now it doesn't work anymore. And now if I reload, I reload this, still work. Why? Because the database is stored locally. We can see this in the inspector. So if I open this inspector and go to application, you can see that I have local storage and I have the index DB here showing my item and the objects stored inside my item and so on. So now I have the database inside the browser as you can see. Even though I don't have the server running at all, I don't have internet running at all, the applications still work. But as I said, that's still read-only. We need to move forward and make more interaction with the application. Of course, to be honest with you, this is not gonna be that easy, going over all your instances, uh, communicating with the backend to replace them with remote DB and then remote DB to local DB and so on, because probably your application is way bigger than mine, but I'm just trying to make a demo, a proof of concept, and then uh, probably you can iterate over this by time. You mean, you mean CouchDB is, is down, like an error or something? That's still for PouchDB like no connectivity. So PouchDB doesn't check if you have internet or not. Couch, PouchDB check if CouchDB is available or not. Okay, so the next step is um, I decided to add an editor to show you what will happen if I start to modify the data. So at this point, this editor again doesn't show much except that I decided to add Vaden split layout to split the, the, the page into two pages. And then I added some editor with some um, first name, last name, email, data like that, and it looks like this. So whenever I select an item, it gets loaded here. First name, last name, email, and update button. If I scroll down, Daniel, and so on. Nothing fancy at this point except that whenever I select item, it gets populated inside the editor. And this is the splitter that can split the page. 
The second step is I want, whenever I click on update, to persist the modification locally. So to do that, I defined inside the update button, whenever you click on update, it goes to LocalDB and call an uh, API called put. And put takes the variable selected and then stored inside my local database. We can see that now. So I will reload this page. For example, let's select Logan, modify his first name, let's call it Devox and last name Poland, and then update. It got modifi modified and it got persisted inside my browser. So that's the second step. I modified the data inside the browser and whenever I load the page, it's gonna be persisted, isn't it? No, yeah, here we go. So this guy, now his first name is Devox and last name Poland, lovely name. Um, so now the data is inside the browser. But I am missing one thing, how to push this data back to the server. That's still easy with PouchDB. So synchronize local storage with remote database is done with a very simple API, again, magic word called sync. You give it, instead of replicate, you call sync. And that's everything. You don't need to worry about anything else. So our friend here said that it's gonna be complicated. Yes, I agree. Luckily, this library take away all this compli uh, complexity and take away the redundant implementation of such code by s just telling you, hey, just call sync and we're gonna do the rest of the work. And as we agreed, it's gonna be CouchDB on the other side. That's why synchronization is unified. You don't need to worry about many uh, implementations. And later on, from CouchDB to your implemented server, wh whatever what database you are using, it's going to be easy. You have a question over there? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to mention this in one minute. <laughs> Good question. Uh, here I added some parameters like live and keep retrying, but those parameters, you can check them out inside the documentation. Um, uh, again, this demo doesn't have uh, anything different at this point. Um, of course, you see that the data is not persisted here because I didn't save to the CouchDB, but uh, let's reopen CouchDB now. And then change his first name again. And then check. So he was item number eight, uh, nine. Um, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think he, it's this one. Yeah. You can see that his first name is Devox and last name Rox. So it, get, it got replicated back to the server. Sounds good. Now, um, now I have performed probably everything that I told you about, like making sure that the data is pushed back to the server as promised, but I also wanted to show you one extra thing, which is also how to use plugins. So probably you don't just want to get the data, read the data, and push back the data. You also want to query the data and perform some operation. Uh, with a kind of this kind of project, with the nature of open source, you get to see a lot of plugins developed by the community. And one of the biggest plugins uh, developed by community is the find plugin that allows you to query the data, like select all and so on. So to start, I added a search box. At this point, noth nothing fancy again, except just a search box that look like this. It's a little bit hidden down there. I need to fix this, I know. So this is a search box that when I search here, it should show me uh, items. And finally here, I added the search functionality itself. So I added the PouchDB find plugin, and I indexed my local database using the field first name. So now I can search using first name. And this is very, very basic way of searching. I'm not checking of case sensitivity. I'm not indexing other fields and so on. I'm just making the most very basic search functionality. 
and uh, finally performing the query itself. So this is how I am making a uh, search calling local DB dot find. So dot find is going to query and then uh, I specify that the query is on first name and in the response I'm populating my page in our HTML. Just for the sake of the demo I'm making it very simple. So let's reload this page. We see that uh, this guy has his first name modified. Let's change a couple other people. So Madison, Devox, and then maybe Mila, let's call her Devox as well. And then if I search for Devox, we're gonna see that those are the result query. I know this demo part is not very, uh, very uh, interesting, looking nice, but at least this is how the search query works. So yeah, if we go over the whole application, I started with a simple application that loads and relies on the server, then migrated this to um, rely on PouchDB instead, instead of the server, and then thought, okay, since I'm using PouchDB, then it makes sense to have my data stored locally, so I used local DB instead of remote DB, then I made synchronization to make sure that the data is replicated from local storage to the server. If you are interested, as I said, this application is available open source here. This is how uh, I have developed it, and all the steps that I have mentioned are available here. I have also this application called Java PWA, since most of you are Java developers. This is my second effort of trying to integrate this all inside Java, so trying to make this all work within Java. At this point, I'm just implementing the basic progressive web apps features, so this is an application how it looked before implementing many of progressive web apps tools, and this is after being implicated. The biggest, um, the biggest difference that you can see is, uh, for example, the theme. I have modified the theme of the mobile, and you can see that I'm not using the browser, um, the browser bar or, or the Chrome of the browser anymore. And those are uh, so some extra steps, so now the application is also available on the home screen. You can click on it and you see this splash screen, and it works independently than the browser. So this is a browser running in a different process than my application. My application is complete independent, native-like application. Uh, this is, again, not complete. It has many steps. You can check them out on my GitHub. And uh, if you are interested, you can follow this project as well to see how I'm going to integrate offline-first functionalities inside Java to be able to do everything from Java perspective. Now, just to go back to my presentation and summarize what I have showed showed you so far. Probably it's also worth mentioning some challenges before we leave. So, during my demo, I actually kind of cheated a bit uh, because I kind of downloaded the whole data inside the browser. And that's something that you probably don't want to do. So if in your enterprise application, maybe your data is 500 megabytes or one giga or maybe more, and you don't really want your user to wait till one gigabyte or one terabyte of data being downloaded inside his device, assuming that his device has one terabyte of free space available. So initial load of data need to be very well architected. And one more thing, you don't want to download all your database. Your database is so complex. It contains a lot of private things. It contains a lot of uh, different things. And it's probably not very interesting for the user. So this is probably the, 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 the top issue on how to architect an offline-first application. You need to really define what is the user session from the database perspective. What is the snapshot of the data that should be downloaded and what should not? So this is the first thing. In my application, luckily, I had flat data, just one table with some, uh, I think, 400 records only. So downloading 400 records didn't take that much time, and it was not occupying my memory. But when you have bigger number of records, millions, for example, you don't really want to download million records inside the browser database. Second thing is the security. 
So in the middle of the demo, I showed you that I can read the database from the browser inspector. And that's probably anyone who is going to use my computer. And here I want to differentiate between two things. If I have Facebook opened inside my computer and someone came and started to use my computer at the same time, then he will be able to use my Facebook. That's fine, I allowed him. But if I signed out from Facebook, I don't want him to come and be able to use my Facebook, isn't it? So you want also to make sure to either encrypt or wipe the data whenever the user is not logged in. Luckily, there are some plugins that allows you to authenticate and encrypt the data and authenticate based on which user and which session the data is stored inside the browser. So you don't need to really wipe the data every time you log out, but you just need to make sure that it's not possible to read the data if another user, user is using the same website. Browser guarantees that this data is not going to be able to, uh, it's not going to be disponible for other domains. So if Facebook.com store a data, then Twitter.com cannot read this data. That's security of a browser. That's something that you don't need to worry about. But what you need to worry about is if I open Facebook.com and Facebook download the data on my browser and then I sign out and then somebody else come on my computer and open Facebook.com, I don't want him to be able to read the data that I had saved previously. That's your responsibility, not the browser responsibility. And finally, uh, one of the most ob uh, obvious uh, problem is the race condition. As our friend over there mentioned, what will happen with data replication? So um, just to explain the, situ the, the problem a little bit more, let's assume that I started to use my offline first app and started to make some modification and stuff like that. And he also started to use exactly the same app. And both of us opened the same person at the same time. But what happened with me is that I went offline, I lost connectivity, but he is still online and we are still modifying the same form. And then he clicked save and I clicked save when I'm offline. He is online, so his modification went to the server. But when I came back and become online, my data is also tries to be pushed back to the server. That's a conflict. How to solve this? PouchDB promises that it's going to make something called the best guess. The best guess on how to merge the data. If there won't be conflict, for example, he modified the first name and I modified the last name, there won't be a conflict. Maybe there is a possibility to merge. Otherwise, let's take this one more time, this example one more time. We both are online and we both open the same form. And we both are modifying the same form and both of us are still online. He clicked save and I clicked save. Which of our data is going to be saved? That's still a problem even if you are online. The only difference between offline first design and this kind of uh, thing is that in offline first, the possibility of occurrence is higher. You might get this problem a little bit more than normal. And that's why you probably need to architect and take care of this problem more often than with online application. But let's get back to the online applications that work online only. You probably have a solution for this, the race condition. What will happen? You probably will show a pop-up screen that uh, this data cannot be saved anymore because somebody else modified the data, or you're gonna probably have a fallback screen or something like that. So you need to implement something like this as well. When I go back online and my data is on the queue offline and try to go back to the server, then check if it's possible to merge or not. If it's not possible to merge, return back to the user and tell him that it's no longer possible to modify this data. Here is your previous modification, and this is the new data. Take a decision on how to merge, or any other kind of user experience that you can figure out inside your application. You need to figure this out as well. So it's again your responsibility, but what I'm trying to explain here is that it's not something new, it's something that we have seen in many other applications as well. So yeah. Question? Uh, curious, 
Good question. So again, because of the nature of uh, this open source application, uh, a lot of community contribution has happened. And I have seen personally a plugin that allows you to connect PouchDB directly to MySQL. And you can imagine why MySQL, because it's the most popular database out there. Uh, I don't know about other databases, but I believe that there are plenty of ways of uh, getting rid of CouchDB layer. But that's not the official supported one. Um, so yeah, uh, to summarize everything, I have one more extra addition for you, which is a practical test. So at the end of the day, how to uh, make sure that uh, your application uh, is really designed for offline first and designed for mobile first. The second, uh, the, first, uh, the first test is to make sure that all the time you are doing mobile first design. Mobile first design means that you are not testing on your laptop. Please stop doing that. Test on your mobile. So uh, usually what we are doing is when, whenever we are developing a web application, we have our browser opened here and we test on our browser. Please stop doing that. Test on your mobile and forget that you have a browser. That's the best way to achieve best experience on mobile devices. Again, we said that we want to target biggest number of users. Second thing is also think about touch-first design. Touch-first design means that your user, when he's using his mobile device, doesn't have a cursor, doesn't have a mouse. So he cannot just uh, go to the up corner and click on this small tiny link that you have. He's using his thumb. So you need to provide big buttons that are clickable from distance without going to corner and edges. And finally, uh, a some designs that I came up with called a f uh, coffee first design. So basically, you give your tester a cup of coffee. This is a yellow coffee. Uh, a cup of coffee and a mobile device. And see if your tester will be able to utilize everything inside the application without dropping the coffee on the mobile. So he doesn't need to use his other hand at all. All the time, everything is accessible with one thump. Just one dump to use everything inside the application. No need to use the other hand at all. No need to squeeze and zoom and hold the other hand as well. Another way of testing this is more probably a little bit dangerous. Ask your tester to go on a speed drive and test. So he will be able to manage or he will need to squeeze. But yeah, that's an official test. Don't do that, please. <laughs> so yeah, that was everything. I, I think I am running a little bit out of time, but uh, if you have uh, any question, I'll be here around. Please come uh, talk to me, ask me any question. I have the demo app available inside this link. I have uh, the Java with progressive web app available on the second link. And of course, my GitHub, uh, you're going to find all the updates that I'm doing on those projects. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the day.